Are you ready for this message, Natalie? You ready, Jen? Online, are you ready? That's all right. Sometimes online is louder than the room. We're going to turn that around today. You guys are going to get a little bit animated once you've recovered from that time of worship. And you're going to join me in this message as we preach together. This feasting message. We have, we have launched our vision theme for 2024, our feast. Rachel did that well last week. And if you missed it, you can catch it on YouTube, on the podcast, etc., etc. This is the second message in this series about feasting. And I do want to help us to be set up for our best 2024 ever. And I feel as though something is stirring in the atmosphere of what God's doing in our community, not just here in Cessnock, but in the Hunter, in our state and in our nation. And so I want to play a part in that. I want to be ready for whatever God's going to do. And so I just feel like this is a great time to get ready for next year. And when we're talking about feasting, I want to help, us set, help set you up for your best 2024. And so as I went to the Word of God to seek Him for a thought, uh, I said, Rachel, I've got this idea that I've got for, for this message on Sunday. And I told her what it was. And she said, oh, no, you can't preach that. That's not right. That's, you shouldn't, you think, we're saving that for later. I said, oh, okay, well, I'll do something else. So God said, slash Holy Spirit, slash my wife, that I should focus on something else. And so here I am. But, but this is really God's word to us today. It, the title of the message is called Lame in Both Feet, Where the Feast Finds You. Where the Feast Finds You. Uh, and, you, know, you might not be ready for it, but it's coming. And the feast is going to be knocking on your door in this message. So <laughs> if you're here in the room, online, you could probably escape without me knowing but I'm telling you right now, today is going to be a day that if you allow it to be, can be transformational for you. So let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to go old school. I'm going to read you an entire chapter of the Bible. Don't get your pillow out. It's going to be, it's going to be good. You're going to enjoy this. 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to read the word together and then we're going to pray. One day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? You know, I don't know why David asked that. I mean, he basically went and killed them all anyway. Just a few chapters before, 2 Samuel chapter 4, uh, it wasn't really him personally, but his army, Saul and David, were effectively at war with each other. And David's army went and slaughtered everyone in uh, Saul, Saul's son, Jonathan, which was David's best friend, and everyone else in their family. And so David here, maybe he's having a, 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 a moral dilemma. And he says... Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? See, David and Jonathan were the best of friends, the closest of friends. They had a relationship that was unique and they were intimately connected as friends. And so he wanted to do something to, to honour his relationship with Jonathan. He says he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. And Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled in both feet. Imagine if, you, imagine if your identity, imagine if the first thing someone said about you was the thing that you hated most about yourself. The thing that was keeping you trapped and stuck was the way in which people introduced you. You know, oh, here's Luke. He got 65 in his HSC when he was... Well, I mean, you could have said something else. You know, you know here, here, here's Steve. Uh, you know, he swears a lot. You know, like, he, he, your worst quality is the, the title headline of your introduction. You know, here's John. He's a criminal. You know, here's Dave. He's an ex-con. You know, here's, 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 here's Sarah. She's, she's a drug addict. I mean, just imagine if that was the thing that people... So here's, here is Zeba saying, yes, there is someone... He's crippled in both feet. You know, they don't even mention his name. So the king asked, David says, where is he? In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Machir, son of Emil. And so David sent for him. David sent for this man and brought him from Machir's home. And his name was Mephibosheth. Everybody say Mephibosheth. <laughs> yeah, you tried. You struggled, didn't you? Don't worry. I've been practicing too. <laughs> Mephibosheth, online? Just, that's great. Mephibosheth. So David sent him, sent for him, brought him 
from a Achaia's home. His name was Mephibosheth, and he was Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. And when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, Greetings, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. So in other words, Mephibosheth was petrified and probably should have been because he was the last surviving family member of the family who was recently massacred by David. And so not only was he just the... All of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. Mephibosheth, you need to go and see David. I mean, I would have put some, you know, bulletproof vests on. You know, I would have been a little bit concerned. Got to there, I down on my hands and knees. David, I'm here. What do you want? David says, do not be afraid. Mephibosheth replied, I'm your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all of the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? In other words, he couldn't believe it. He didn't feel like he deserved it. And then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. In other words, all of a sudden, Mephibosheth, who was nobody from nowhere, hiding from everybody, is now given the land that his king father Saul had owned. I mean, it's a complete turnaround for this one guy. I mean, what a day. It's like winning the lottery 10 times over in one day. Hopefully you don't play the lottery, but if you do, it's a waste of money. You should be given to the A&B offering instead. So everything for Mephibosheth changed in one moment. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table, David said. And Ziba replied, yes, my lord and king, I am your servant and I will do what you have commanded. And from that time on, listen to this. From that time on, as we wrap up this chapter, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Jesus, as we begin to unpack this passage this morning, I pray that we would not see this as just another chapter in the Bible, just another message on a Sunday, but we would open our hearts and be ready to receive everything that you would have for us. Help us to see ourselves right now in this story. And Lord God, I pray that as we leave this room today, you will have transformed us. You will have changed us. And we will step out of this place totally assured of who we are in you and all that you would have for us. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Now, who loves a Christmas feast? I do. I love a Christmas feast. In fact, to be honest with you, I love any feast, anytime, anywhere. If there's a feast going, I'm there. And sometimes I just find myself among a feast. I just, oh, what's happening? Oh, there's a feast happening. It's a gift I have. I just end up in the middle of a feast. In fact, we went to visit someone last night. This isn't in my notes. And we we're just popping in to say hello. Turns out it's a feast. Never knew it was coming. We we're just going to go and say hi to some friends of ours. And we turn up and there's prawns and there's um, roast chicken and there's like home-baked sourdough. There's uh, there's birthday cake, which is chocolate mud cake. Oh, this is all new. Well, we just went to say hello. I mean, I found myself in the middle of a feast. And I love a, I love a Christmas feast because it's the feast of all feasts, because it's the expectation that there's more food than can be eaten. In fact, if you eat all of the Christmas food on Christmas Day, you've failed as a host because there has to be enough Christmas food left for the next day, Boxing Day, and then possibly the next week while you aren't at work and you aren't doing your normal routine. So the feast at Christmas is the ultimate feast. Now, when I was young, I was an only child, single mother. We lived with our, my grandparents, and so our big Christmas feast was four people. It's pretty fun, isn't it, four people for Christmas? And so when I got married, I married my beautiful wife, Rachel, who's one of six children, and now all of her siblings, or a lot of her siblings, are married. We've got their own children. And so to go from a Christmas that's four to a Christmas that's 40 is a big difference. And the kind of preparation and volume of food and catering and hosting and furniture that's required to cater for 40 people is different than four. And so when I first turned up to the Rachel um, Christmas family party, it was quite overwhelming. There were so, so many people, so many children and I was like, this is more than what I would be normally exposed to. 
And I kind of felt like I should have been bringing something. Like I didn't have enough to bring. Like a, a normal box of Cadbury's favourites isn't enough. When I mean, there's two roast turkeys, you know, there's 40 kilos of prawns, and you know, there's there's ham, there's stuffing, there's lollies, there's cashews, nuts, there's there's dessert, there's trifles. There's I mean, whatever you have at Christmas, that's what we have times four. It's like it's this enormous banquet. So nothing really sort of cut the mustard when it comes to saying thank you for the generosity of the feast. And so I turn up as a little bit of an outsider, you know, like I said, a box of Cadbury's favourites wouldn't cut it, to, to take a seat at a table of this extraordinarily generous feast. And, and what I'm saying, that I'm telling us that story because today God has brought me to this moment to help us to see what it feels like to step into the shoes of another man that was at a table that was beyond anything that he'd ever experienced before. To step into the, to the shoes of the crippled Mephibosheth. I want you to experience what it's like to step into the room and put your feet under the table that you don't deserve to sit at. We're going to see ourselves as Mephibosheth in this story today because it's a story that is a story of powerful life transformation. And this morning I know in this room and online, God is extending an invitation to you and to me to be transformed just like the character in our story. His story is our story today. And... In this story, God asks Mephibosheth three questions. And they're the same three questions that God's going to ask us today. So are you ready to talk to God? He's going to ask you three questions. Are you ready for the first question? <clears throat> the first question is this. Where are you? Mephibosheth, we learn in the story was hiding from the king. Mephibosheth was hiding from David. And David's court, David's army, despite Mephibosheth being the rightful heir to the throne of Israel, he was Saul's grandson. So he should have been in a place of honour. But the circumstances of the life of his grandfather meant that he could not inherit what should have been rightfully his. Come on. The circumstances of his family meant that he could not inherit what should have been rightfully his. Anyone ever lived that life where the circumstances of your family mean that you can't inherit what should have been rightfully yours? Mephibosheth so feared for his life that he hid in another family's home. Despite being from a royal line, he decides to go and hide himself in a house, nowhere, and be a nobody. He was willing to give up all of his autonomy, all of his agency, all of his identity, his freedom. He was so low that he found a town with the same name. Lo de Bar. <laughs> now, that was a, a low joke, I understand that. <laughs> And I am lowering the bar on the jokes. Now, you're keeping up. But I can't make that kind of joke without actually talking about what this town does actually mean. Because the, the town, Loda Bar, it actually means without pasture. Or it could be interpreted in other ways to say, well, it's barren. Nothing, nothing comes from it. Other translations say that it could also mean mute or dumb. There's nothing to come from it. It's leaderless. It's, it's pastureless. No life there. Without communication. False. Untrue. And this is where Mephibosheth found himself, put himself, because he was hiding from who he probably should have been. So here's my question. Where are you? Are you hiding? Are you hiding from the king? You know, this story is a powerful story. It's, 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 I mean, sometimes I wonder why bother telling this one particular man's story. 
I mean, it was interesting in 1 Samuel chapter 4, we'll get to later, how he became lame. But then again, in 1 Samuel chapter 11, I think it talks about uh, how, he was bl- how he was blamed for double-crossing David and didn't. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered so much. that His life seems to be somewhat incidental, but for some reason, the author has decided to include it in the story. And, and when you read it, you can see that the story points to more than just the story of a man with crippled feet. It points forward to what it would be like for you and I to have a relationship with a king like David, because David was a type of Christ. And as you read this story, we have to see it like that, that what would Jesus do in this story? And the invitation that I'm making to you today to see yourself as Mephibosheth is also to see David as Jesus. And so this invitation is for you to see the response of King Jesus when he hears that you are hiding from him. Where are you? It's the same call that God made to Adam in the garden when Adam made the fatal mistake of wanting to be like God. And God said, Adam, where are you? And in this story, David says, Mephibosheth, where are you? And today in this room online, I'm saying to you, church, where are you? Why are you hiding from Jesus? Why are you hiding? I just imagine as David's... uh, the servants go to Lodabar and they find the house of, uh, that Mephibosheth is living in and they're knocking on the door. Hey, Mephibosheth. Hello. It's, it's King David's men. Hello. He's, he's in the back room. He's underneath the floorboards. He's like, I'm not coming out there. Who are you hiding from? Come on, guys. Let's go. There's no Mephibosheth in here, guys. You must have the wrong place. This is Lodabar. I don't come from here. You've got the wrong guy. Jesus, isn't he? He's often knocking on the door of our heart. Hello, are you there? Are you, willing to, are you willing to say yes to Jesus today? I wonder if you've been hiding from Jesus. Where are you? And the second question in this story is, is quite profound as well, where David says to Mephibosheth, sit with me. Will you sit with me? You see, in verse 7, David says to Mephibosheth, who we know he's afraid, he says, Don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. And I will give you all that the property once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. You will eat here with me at the king's table. You see, Mephibosheth didn't just come out of hiding to meet the king. He came out of hiding to feast with the king. Jesus is saying, will you sit with me? Will you sit with me? See, some of us see and and are okay with the idea of Jesus saving us from ourselves and saving us from our sin and saving us from being lost in hiding with a false identity. We're often not okay with Jesus saying, feast with me. I'm not just saving you from yourself. I'm saving you into your new self. And there's two main objections that we have to being included with Jesus at the table. We don't deserve it is a big one. When we really discover what it's like to be included in the king's feast, well, I don't think I deserve it. Second argument often is, well, I would like to earn my way to the table. I understand it's a good place to be. I think it's others have been there. It looks great. And so as soon as I've got my life together, I will be adequately prepared and positioned to be at, uh, to be at one or level with the station of the king and sit at his table. I will be a self-made man, a self-made person. I will have built something enough of myself that it would make sense for me to sit with the king at the king's table. That's the other objection. Though I'm not ready yet, but when I'm ready, I'll be right there with you, Jesus. So there's those of us who are, who are full of shame and, and, and are full of self-loathing and self-hate, and we look at ourselves and we feel broken and ashamed, and we aren't seeing ourselves as deserving to sit with the king. And there are those of us who think that one day we will be able to be with the king. And we can work ourselves and earn ourselves a place at the table. They're the two main objections. And you see, David and Jesus answers those objections by saying, Yes, correct. You do not and never can deserve it. 
a seat at the table. And also, you can never work hard enough to earn a seat at this table with me. But for both of those objections, I've prepared a place for you anyway. What a king. King Jesus. I mean, if that doesn't stir your spirit, you've got a heart of stone. And Jesus is going to break it this morning. Because this story of Mephibosheth is the story of you. It's my story. And King David is King Jesus, the type, the one that comes before. And in this story, the author is showing us what it's like to have the king come and find you in the middle of nowhere. When you're lost in your own stuff, if you've forgotten who you are and your identity is that thing that, that is your darkest and deepest shame, it's, it's who you are. And Jesus comes and finds you, knocking on the door and says, Come and sit with me. Will you sit with Jesus today? And the final question this text asks as we begin to wrap up is this. Because there's being found by Jesus, there's sitting at the table, but there's one, less, one more thing we have to do. What do you think it is? We've, he's come and he's found you. And you've responded and you've said yes and you're, you're sitting with the king. And, and then they'd start to bring out the prawns. They start to bring out, I'm not sure they have their prawns in the Middle East, but they bring out the lamb. They bring out the goat. They bring out the chickens, the, the turkeys, the eyeballs. That's right. They bring out the stomach. They bring out the, the jowls. They start bringing it out. They bring out the fruit. They start laying it on the table in front of you in front of King David and David's son, Absalom, and they're laying down the food on the table. I love how this story ends in verse 13. I mean, it starts out, I mean, if I was Mephibosheth, I'd think, okay, like when this was written, his story had already, he lived his story. I would have gone back to the author and said, you don't really have to mention the feet. I mean, and if you do, just mention it once at the start of the story. You don't need to mention it three or four times. We get the picture that I can't walk, okay? We get it. But this story ends here, verse 13. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lame in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. He ate regularly at the king's table. See, your place at the feast in 2024 and the feast that I know God's going to bring into your life has got nothing to do with your capacity as one to be able to enjoy the feast or prepare the feast or bring a box of chocolates to the feast. It's got nothing to do with your ability, your skill, your talent. It's got nothing to do with your spirituality, your age, your gender, your qualifications. In fact, the one qualification that Jesus is looking for to find you at the table is that you would be broken. He wants to sit you down and not see you get up. Mephibosheth couldn't leave the table. He was trapped in a state of feasting. The feasting found him. Come on, the feasting found him. He was in Lodabar, the place that was barren. Fast forward one day and he cannot escape the feast. I mean, if you get a hold of that, that's what Jesus does. He takes you from where you are, broken, hopeless, lost, unknown, wrongfully identified. And he picks you up because you can't get there yourself. And he sits you at the table. He pushes the chair in and he brings out the feast. And he invites you to feast with him at the table. He doesn't leave you there on your own. He sits right next to you. He sits with you at a level station, the same status with the king, even though you are of the enemy's family. And he sits you at the table and he says, feast with me, eat with me, enjoy with me, be a part of my family. And even if Mephibosheth wanted to, he couldn't get up. 
he was trapped in a feast. (laughs) And I, I want you to see that in 2024, that is your story. That you are in the shoes of the one who is at the table with the king and just cannot escape the feast that is coming your way. Come on, why don't you just receive that as a promise for you in 2024? Yes, Jesus, I see you as, I see myself how you see me. Yes, I want to sit with you at the table and yes, I will feast with you. I will take everything that you have for me and I will not be ashamed. I I will not be, I not feel guilty, but I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to accept who you have called me to be, a co-heir with you at the table to feast on everything that you have for me. We're the one family. I belong. This is where I'm meant to be, in the King's court, with the King's favour, at the King's table, enjoying the King's feast. Who would have thought that that's your story too? You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is the part of the Pentateuch, and the Pentateuch was written, um, and it would have been written when David uh, was in power. And I wonder, as these stories were read, if Mephibosheth had remembered Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. Because remember, when David gave, gave Mephibosheth the land, he gave, him the, he gave him Saul's land, which was land in the promised land. It wasn't land on the outskirts. It was land right in the best part of uh, Israel. And that's not where Mephibosheth was, remember? He was in Lodabar, pastureless. And so he's been restored to this beautiful place. And oh, can you just imagine him there in this new home of, of abundance and eating at the king's table regularly, not once, regularly. And then maybe one night, I don't know, this is me taking some poetic license, go with me. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the daily reading for the day and he comes across this verse in verse 10. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land He swore to give you when He made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses were richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig. And you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. And when you've eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Can you see the pattern? That Jesus comes and he takes us from where we are in our our hopelessness, lost, broken, slave experience. And he lifts us up and he places us in a promised experience, a promised land experience. That's where we find ourselves today. And so what I want to do, I want to pray for all of us right now for this to be our promise for 2024. Why don't you bow your heads, close your eyes, and let me pray this prayer over you. If you're in the room right now and you've never said yes to the invitation to come and meet with Jesus, to sit with Jesus, to experience His love for you, could you just raise your hand right now? Let me know that's you. And online, let us know in the chat if that's you. Because I want to pray this prayer for you, especially for you, that you can have a first-time experience and a first-time encounter with this this like irrational, radical love of Jesus that's undeserved and can never be earned. And for those of us who have said yes to Jesus before, I got a picture of of Jesus sending me to this room today, knocking on the door. Hey, Mephibosheth, where are you? Have you forgotten that you can come and sit at the table with me? You can come and eat with me. You can feast with me. So next year, I want this 2024 to be a year where you are all in for Jesus, all in for me, at the table with me, co-heirs with me, enjoying the presence of God like never before, remembering who you are and what you have in Jesus' name. So when you pray this prayer this morning, church, if you've prayed it before, I want you to pray it in a fresh way where you step into those three questions. step into those three questions. Where are you? You can say, Jesus, I'm right here. When he says, will you sit with me? You can say, yes. Will you feast with me? You'll say, yeah, 2024. I'm going. I'm all in, Jesus. I'm all in. So come on, church. Why don't you pray this prayer after me? Jesus, this is my decision. Today, I say yes to you. 
to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life, forgive my sin, and fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks.